Hello, this is Bob Pellerin, CTO Bob, and today I'm very excited to be talking about VMware's vSphere ESXi 7.0. That's a brand new version. I'm not going to go through all the features. I'm actually going to show you how to get it installed onto a server. So if you'll join me on my screen here, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, demonstrate how this could be done. So first I'm going to start the recording of my screen. There we go. So we are now capturing uh, the screen hopefully you can see that there and uh, let's go ahead and, ahead and use Rufus uh, current version is uh, 3.9 so this basically we've uh, executed this here and this is what pops up what you want to do is you want to click on the select button here and in my case I selected this image here which is the uh, VMware uh, VM visor installer for the 7.0 so what that's going to do is it's going to produce a USB key that I'm then going to insert into my server, boot off of it, and then do the full install from there. So let's go ahead and just click on start and click on yes. And it's going to delete everything on the key, which is fine. And go ahead and... Now, one of the things I'd like to mention is prior to this, I actually made sure we've got a, a Dell PowerEdge R640, we made sure that we updated the BIOS, all the firmware on the unit uh, to make sure that there's no conflicts or get it as close to uh, today's versions as possible. And the best way to do that really is to either go on the website. Um, in our case, we basically used something called the, the Dell EMC Repository Manager. And you can download that and that allows you to go and build an an image on a USB key that you then boot and it's, um, it's basically a small Linux uh, executable that will run run through all the different checks and balances whenever it finds one of the components that you have it will then go and check the, the firmware and update if there needs to be up, an update done. So this is at 72. It's going to take a little while. I think we're going to use magic and just pause this. And since this is completed, we will return. That was actually quite fast. So we've uh, we now have the ready button right here, which means that it's finished. We can do close and now we're ready. So the idea is just to go ahead and insert the USB key and restart the server. Let's go take a look at that. Okay, so we've gone ahead and inserted the USB key into the server. It is next to me, so you'll probably hear the hurricane uh, force winds built into the server in a few seconds. And what we have, as you can tell by this screen, is you're looking at the uh, integrated, what they call an iDRAC. So it's the Dell Remote Access Controller. Uh, version 9, this is the Enterprise. So it allows me to see the screen here and... I can go and click on power, click on power on. You want to continue, yes. And you'll hear it in the background. At that point, what we will do is we will make sure that we press on the button to have the ability to control where it boots off of. There is a USB key inside of it uh, that we will use to put on the uh, VMware and we will use the external one from the front to boot uh, to start the uh, ESXi, the mouthful, uh, version 7. So I'm just going to wait for this to start. We may have to fast forward this in post production. As you can tell, it's got the uh, 2.5.4 BIOS on here, which is the last one as of April 2020. Now you got to press F11 for the boot manager. And I actually have the server right next to me, so I have the keyboard on my left hand, and I have my mouse for the system I'm recording with on my right hand. So here we are in the boot manager. At that point, what we need to do is we need to go and select the one-shot UEFI boot menu. Go ahead and press return on this. And at that point, you have different options. As I mentioned, we're looking at this point, the front USB, which is a, basically a USB key. I'm gonna go ahead and select it. Okay. 
and it, and it does show you the IP address of the iDRAC 9 that I'm using. So that would be, uh, in my case, it's from a DHCP uh, server. And so I was automatically allocated to it and I just left it like that since this is just a test environment. And of course I am connected to it directly, so. And there we go. So now the installer is there. It's going to go ahead and run us through it. It's quite simple once you've done this a few times. It's it's really more about setting up uh, an IP address. Um, and of course, you're going to go with whatever's in your environment. If you're in a test environment, you can certainly pick a different uh, subnet mask or something like that to uh, be in a different range. So there we go. First time I get the C70. As you can tell from this, I'm using a, a Silver 4114, which is basically a, a 10 core dual CPU in this case, so it gives me 20 cores, plus you hyper, add the hyper thread, excuse me, then you end up with uh, 40 virtual CPUs that you can use. I've got 128 gigs of RAM, so and this is overkill just for testing, but it comes in handy when I want to test heavier loads. And so far it looks pretty much like the versions before, whether it's uh, 6, 6.5 or 6.7. I understand a lot has changed in version 7 where they can now uh, support Kubernetes, for example, directly at, as part of the base OS. All right, so let's go ahead and do enter on this. And we're going to accept and continue. And then should be scanning and asking me what I want to load. It'll probably detect I had 6.7 set up because I want to make sure the hardware was it was good. And uh, so I've, I've got a few different things I threw in there. I threw in an NVMe drive. I threw in uh, uh, a couple of SSD drives. So what I want to do is I actually want to take this one here. Now it should detect that I have 6.7 on there and Based on the past, I should be getting an option to either upgrade or replace what is there. In this case, I think I'm going to start completely over. So we're just going to go ahead and down click, press the space bar, put the X there, press enter. And so it's going to ask me which kind of keyboard I want. I'm going to stick to US. And it's going to ask me for the root password. It's very important what you put here to remember it. Um, in the past, I've put in random things and uh, once forgot to write it down and of course you're fine for the rest of the day until the next day when you go what did I put then it's a little awkward so I'm just going to go ahead and take the secondary keyboard here and type in a password just to make sure that we can get into it afterwards all right you enter And if we're ready to install it, press F11. And this should be relatively quick. Again, most of the time consuming stuff is in the for before when you've got to put all the firmwares, uh, got to go to the repository, download the whole thing, create the USB key, boot from that. That is a long process. I mean, you expect to, I'm going to say waste, but spend perhaps a good hour on that depending on the system you've got how complex it is because it will reboot um, multiple times and once you've gone through the configuration once you've added drives you go into the raid controller you've got add things that adds more time uh, you'll see I mean it, it, in no time at all you spend a couple hours okay so we are done and at this point it just tells us that we need to go ahead and press enter to reboot of course take out your usb key prior to rebooting or else you're going to be going back through the installation all over again so let's go ahead and take that out and reboot usb key and press enter it tells you it's shutting down the services and drivers and then we lose the signal temporarily and it reboots from here
don't know if you can hear the fans, but they're, uh, they go off and make quite a racket at first, as they're going at full speed. Now at this point we have not reconfigured the network uh, or anything, so it will be getting it from DHCP. What we're, we can actually do is go into it, since we are still logged in through the iTrack, it allows us to see the uh, back end uh, the screen directly. I actually have another screen on that server since it's a test environment. I don't have racks and racks of them, so it's, but if you had multiple racks, this is the best way of, of uh, doing it. So I'm just going to let it boot. We're not going to touch anything at this point. So the first thing that we will want to do is we will want to go in and change the IP address to give it a fixed IP address. It's uh, pretty important in the sense that, especially if you've got multiple servers or a rack environment, you want to be able to control which one is which and not have this random DHCP allocated IP address to it. Um, the sanest way, of course, is if you want to let it get a DHCP assigned IP address and then go in the DHCP lock it into place so you basically reserve it and then you can name it and uh, if you've got multiple servers put a sticker in front of the server identifying what it is um, a lot of individuals and companies will go and put names um, in your farm so it could be server one server two server three but the idea is just to uh, always make it easy for you to know exactly what server you are accessing and what server you're modifying i hear a lot of stories of individuals that go and reconfigure things and if you've got racks of similar systems uh, i've heard stories of people changing things and going whoops turns out i got the wrong server perhaps it's assigned to different clients it makes it pretty awkward at that point because then you have to undo what you've done and you've got to go back and redo it again um, or it may cause some kind of problem um, one of the things that it does require is a dhcp uh, service obviously in this case and you'll also need a DNS server um, writing when you're doing this. And the reason you need the DNS by the way is if you're going to be installing the vCenter it is one of the re requirements. I haven't checked for version 7 but I'm, I'm pretty much I'll guarantee you that it's one of the requirements. There are waivers around it, but really you should have, whether it's on Linux or Microsoft product or anything else you can think of, you need to have a, a DNS server in your environment uh, if you're going to go and do the vCenter next. In my case, for a strict uh, single server, uh, you can get around that. That's fine. And in, in fact, if you don't have a DHCP and you're doing this, um, it wouldn't be much of a problem because you can, as we will do, go and assign one manually. So it's almost started all the services. It seems to me to be a little slower than 6.7. I haven't timed it, so it's nothing official. But I don't usually sit there and watch it boot either, and we're, uh, we're doing that right now, so. Here we go. Okay, so it, it did give me an IP address in the DHCP. If I wanted to change it at that point, you would press the F2 key. I don't know if you can see that, but if I were to go here and press F2, then it's going to ask me to go ahead and put the password in there. I'm going to go off screen for a sec. Okay, so here we go. And... So here's where we could change the password, we could change lots of things. I'm just gonna go ahead and um, click on Configure Management Network. And at that point, I could actually take a look at my adapters. So these are all the adapters that I have. Some are connected, some are not. Um, so if I want to change it, I could certainly go ahead and do that and say, okay, well, I, I mean, at this point, I don't really care, I can leave this one there. As you can tell, I've got a, a few of them. I've got a couple that are uh, hooked up to fiber optic on these two and then I've got two that are 10G and I've got two that are 1G. 
Um, so I'm, I'm just going to leave it to that. I'm going to go ahead and reconfigure it to be static. And I'm going to go ahead and just type in, probably helps if I have the numlock on here. Uh, that's not what I meant to do. Okay, that, so I'm going to put myself to 220. It's a test environment, so I don't have much on here really at this point. Uh, and that looks good, so I'm just going to go ahead and do enter. If I do escape at this point, it's going to say, you, you sure? Yes. Okay, so I've done that. So I can see it on the screen as, as you can there on the right side. And we should be good to go. So I'm just going to get out here, go back to this. Okay, so this screen can stay the way it is. We no longer need to be in front of, of the console. So let's go ahead and minimize this. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and type in the IP address that you've just assigned it or that was assigned, it would be there on the screen as we saw. And of course, uh, I'm using Chrome, so it's going to say your connection is not private. You gotta click on advance, click on proceed, where it says unsafe, and this is what it looks like. At that point, since this is a server, you're gonna go ahead and type in root, and we're gonna go ahead and put in our password that we typed in. And there we go. Now it's asking us if we want to join the consumer experience program. I'm going to say no, since this is a test environment. And of course, now it's telling me that I'm using a trial. So I've got 60 days. So you need to uh, get your license from my VMware, uh, which is their, their website, and um, go ahead and insert it there. And that will unlock it for you, depending on if you've got the essentials or you've got the standard or you've got whichever version you've got. So. What we're going to do now is, interestingly enough, it shows us uh, right away the two storage. I had already created uh, data stores, and apparently it's uh, remembered them from previous. And uh, so I should be able to go on here and take a look at what I've got here. Uh, data store browser, and you can see I've got an active directory server on here. And it seems to still all be there. And if I go and look at the other one, I've got an RDP server. And again, I, these are tests that we were running and they're there so I could uh, go ahead and add these to my environment. And this is roughly what it looks like. Let me just close this here. So this is roughly what it looks like with version seven. I can go maybe to uh, monitoring, take a quick look. This is, uh, I wanna see if they've changed a whole lot. So if I go on hardware, um, there shouldn't be any events really. It's this has been mounted, so it's mounted automatically. These stores, yeah, stores, notification, performance. You can see uh, CPU, you can see the RAM, network, you can see the disk. And let's see what else we can take a quick look at. Um, again, licensing, there is nothing there from a hardware point of view. There's power management. You can modify this here. You can take a look at what packages are installed. You can take a look. So it's, um, let's see what we've got here. We've got a couple of VI, VIBs that have been loaded, uh, Dell EMC tech and so forth. So, and sell your services, your users. I mean, there's not much of a change look-wise from the previous version. Um, there are my adapters, devices, persistent memory. Well, that's roughly it. Now, at this point, what you would do is, in order to get started, is you would basically go into virtual machines and you would create or register a VM. And creating is just as easy as clicking on create. And in this case, I'm just going to take a quick look around with you. So if we want to create a brand new one, and we do next, and this is what it's going to ask us, obviously, to name it. We can say test. And so which compatibility version we want. Now, if you're going to bring this back into an environment where we have 6.7, 6.5, hopefully not before that, but perhaps you still have 6.0, 
And if you're still using 5, 5.5, now is really, really the time to make sure that you, you switch those over. Um, I know a lot of firms that what they've done is they've gone from 5.5 and they've gone over to the 6, uh, lower end 6s first to make sure everything was fine and then gradually bring them back to 6.7. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody having problems, but I know that some of the migration paths are not supported. Like you're not supposed to go from 5.0 to 6.7 directly, for example. So read up on that. It's well documented. They've got uh, best practices online. They have all those things available to you. Make use of them. So in this case, I mean, you're just uh, trying something new, actually. Guest selection. So let's say it's going to be a Windows. And if we want to have a Windows uh 2019 64-bit you do next and then you say where do you want it to store it i'm going to store it on i'm going to say here how big do i want it well maybe i want it very very small how many cpus do you want and this is where you it's just the same as the old uh versions and you can give it this you know the memory you want you can, change this to gigs and say I want to have 8 gigs, I want to have, I mean, if this was a real environment then you would make sure that you select the proper things and of course network adapters, I had quite a, a, a choice here. Uh, usually I recommend if you're going to use adapter type uh, where it says E1000E, that is really a legacy adapter so what you'd want to do is go ahead and select uh, the the VMX Net 3, that is a much faster uh, card. What you'll see is you'll be able to get 10G speeds, for example, as opposed to the E1000E. Uh, I've had people before uh, email me and say, hey, I, I don't understand this. I've got this 10G card in there and I'm, I'm, it's not going fast. I can't do this. I'm doing testing. And, and, and yeah, a lot of the time it's just they originally selected E1000E, perhaps just by doing next, 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 and it just chose it by default. Um, or... Yeah, somebody had picked it, perhaps. So, but that's the gist of it. This is what it is. And then you just do next, and then once you're done, you click on finish, and it's going to go ahead and create a VM for us. And it's as easy as that. And now I've got a test. And, of course, now we would still have to go and install the Windows 2019 that I selected. Uh, you'd have to find the ISO. And at that point, what you would do is you would go into test, and you can show you quickly and right click go ahead and do edit settings and the easiest way at this point is to go and select a data store iso file so generally what i do is i go and i create on one of the data stores a directory called iso where i put the isos of whatever operating systems i need whether it's red hat or microsoft or whatnot and then i would put that in there and then once it's in there i could then go and select the iso from here and make it boot uh, so when the, when the computer starts, see what it says here, connect, you click on connect, and then you make sure that when it starts, it will connect at power on. And from this point on, when you start the virtual machine, it will load this. Then you'll be able to go through the installation of the operating system as if you had originally uh, put in a CD or DVD or put in a USB key directly into, uh, into it. Um, and to start it, basically you highlight your machine, it says power on right there on the screen, you just press on that and it would start. Of course, in this case, nothing would start because there was nothing in the test. Uh, you could also right click and go to power and power on, a little slower. And as you can tell, all of the different things here, you've got, uh, you've got the option to export, you can, uh, uh, you can and we have no snapshots in this case, but you could take a snapshot if you wanted to change things along the way to a VM. By the way, snapshots are not meant to be backups. So if you are somehow using snapshots in your environment, or you've, if you're, uh, if you're not, I'm hoping you're not running a lot of machines if you're doing that, but I, I know some of the smaller uh, companies sometimes take a snapshot and they assume that that's like a backup and, hey, I've, I've got a way of bringing this back. However, the snapshots, uh, the way they react is they will freeze the files and then create a new uh, file from that point on and will take the changes done. Uh, the problem is, is the more snapshots you have and the longer you keep them, uh, the more I've found it creates a problem. I've seen a lot of failures in VMware due to the fact that 
people have taken way more snapshots than they should have, um, ran out of disk space and, and then had a problem and then they try to recreate everything. And one of the videos, in fact, that I created, one of the most popular videos we did, is actually a, how to undo a snapshot manually when the snapshot option doesn't work. Because in general, you can go into manage snapshots, click the snapshot and delete it. And uh, that one time I created that video because I was unable to delete it. A uh, client called and said, hey, what do I do? And that's when I you know, had to figure out how to do it. And I decided to, to uh, record how to do it. Just I was there and I had to do it anyways. And it seems to have helped a lot of people. So I'm glad it worked out for that. Uh, in general, though, that is not something that is that common. Uh, it's really don't run out of disk space. At the end of the day, do not over allocate things. Uh, I, I I know that you can over allocate memory, you can over allocate CPU resources and drives. The problem is, is over time, once you start going over, uh, you reach the limits of the virtual machines. And if you're over allocated, you will have a problem. And that's when it breaks. And everybody seems to think this is, you know, going to be for two, three years and it's not going to grow that much. It happens a lot more than you would think. Uh, a lot of firms after three years will say, hey, this thing is working really well. It's it's still fast. It's still we can, you know, we can add memory in the future if we need to. And they'll keep it longer than any of us would have thought. And so you end up with scenarios where the drives are just uh, full for all the VMs and it causes problems. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I think it's the first time I try with having both me and the screen at the same time. So hopefully you enjoyed that and let me know what you thought, please. Give us a thumbs up. That really helps um, with analytics and whatnot. Google, uh, or rather YouTube, uh, likes that in the rankings. So it helps us subscribe. We're trying to bring up our subscription as much as possible as well. And please visit www.ctobob.com. There's more content. We've got some blogs. We're going to have some uh, newer podcasts coming up soon. And we hope that uh, you enjoyed this. Drop us a line below. We'd love to hear what you think of version 7.